that they're producing valid findings. Um, in contrast to a voluntary response sample is a representative sample, which is a group. I guess it's a group twice, because I wrote is a group twice. A representative sample is a group of people chosen so their characteristics closely match those of the population of interest. Tremendous difference in the quality of knowledge of making these two types of samples. So the question is, how do you draw a representative sample? What's the magic here? Well, you might think that you can simply set yourself up in a public place like a shopping mall and ask willing passers-by to answer questions. After all, that's kind of randomly selecting them. You're not ask, they're not volunteering themselves, you're asking them. And you're asking everyone who passes by, or at least trying to, so you're not biasing it in any particular way. Would that accurately reflect, say, we decided to go to Yorkdale, or perhaps a safer place, can you name another mall, <laughs> square one, and uh, we set ourselves up uh, and ask passers-by if they would answer questions about any particular subject, would we get a more, a sample that's representative, say, of the entire population of Canada or of Toronto, at least? Why not? Excellent answer. Excellent answer. It's true, we know this from research, that the kinds of people, market research actually, the kinds of people who go to malls are not representative of the national or even an urban sample. The woman described them, some of these people who are overrepresented as mall rats, which I guess means teenagers who hang out in malls, correct? And it's also true that there's an overrepresentation of elderly people in malls. There's an underrepresentation of rural folk, people who live in rural areas in malls. So you get all of these biases, and you find that the kinds of people that you would select by standing around a mall and asking if they participate in a survey don't actually represent even the population of, um, of Toronto. Rather, these people represent a convenience sample which consists merely of people who are easiest to reach. So we know a voluntary response sample is no good, a convenience sample isn't good in terms of its representativeness. We were after this representative sample. Uh, what we want, really, is a co special kind of representative sample called a probability sample. A probability sample involves the following characteristics. First of all, people are chosen at random, and each individual's chance of being chosen to be in the sample is known. We know it. The researcher knows what that probability is. If the probability of any particular individual being chosen is 1 out of 10,000, or 1 out of 600, or whatever, we know it. It's non-zero, it's greater than zero, I should say. Okay, so there is some probability that each individual will be chosen. Um, and then, if those cases, if this, these conditions hold, we've got a probability sample. If people are chosen at random, and an individual's chance of being chosen is known and greater than zero, then we've got what we're after. So how do you do it? Well, the first thing you need in order to draw a probability sample is to get your hands on a sampling frame. A sampling frame. A sampling frame is a list of all the people in the population of interest. So, for example, let's say I go to every religious institution. Let's say I want to, I'm interested in people, people's religious behavior. And I go to every religious in Toronto. And I go to every religious institution in Toronto. I'm in touch with the director, the minister, the, whatever the head of the, the institution is. Uh, and I ask for permission to take, get hold of the membership list of each institution. And uh, I'm successful. I get every membership list of every religious institution in Toronto. Uh, could, and I'm interested to remember in religious behavior. Could I draw and random individuals from those membership lists 
if I'm interested in the religious behavior of people in Toronto? Would that be a reasonable sampling frame, do you think? Anyone? Okay, I'm interested in religious behavior. I want to find out whether people uh, go to pray, how often they go to pray, how much, how strongly they believe in supernatural powers, and so on and so forth. Um, and in order to get a sampling frame, I go to every single religious institution in Toronto and successfully procure a membership list from the head of each of those institutions. So I've got a list of everybody who is a member of every religious institution, all religions, in the GTA. Would that be an adequate sampling frame if I'm interested in examining the religious behavior of Torontonians? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. No, why not? Pardon me? They might be doing different things, but I'm not interested if they're doing different things. I only want to know how often they do it, and I want to know how much they believe. And I can do that. I can find that out. But you're right about the no point. Yes. Yes, there's the answer I'm, I'm fishing for. Some people don't go to religious institutions. They're not members of religious institutions, yet they may be deeply spiritual. It is not a prerequisite to be religious, to belong to a church or some other religious institution. And therefore, if I merely base my findings on people who belong to religious institutions, I'm going to have a very biased sampling frame, won't I? Because I know from the census, for example, when people are asked, what's your religion? Something like over 20% of Canada, Canadians say, I don't have a religion, or I don't believe in God. So I'm going to miss all of them. And then I'm going to miss people who are religious, who do believe in God and so on, but just don't belong to a religious institution of any sort. They might say, you know, I'm a spiritual person, I have my own way of dealing with this, but I don't go to church or synagogue or whatever else, a temple or a mosque. Okay, so it's, it, it might be good for some purposes. If I was interested in examining the behavior of people who belong to religious institutions, that would be a great sampling frame. But if I'm interested in examining the religious behavior of people in general, it's a lousy sampling frame. So how do I get a sampling frame of everybody in Toronto or everybody in Canada? Any ideas? Telephone directory that somebody say? Well, if not, I'll say it. We can get the entire telephone directory for Canada on a CD-ROM, and we therefore have access to information on everybody with a phone in the country. It's not a perfect mechanism, but nonetheless, it is one way of doing it. Unfortunately, some people are unlikely to have uh, to have listed phone numbers, especially really well-to-do people who often have unlisted phone numbers, and poorer people who can't afford a phone or who are homeless. So I'm, I'm going to be missing the extremes when I do that. Not necessarily a lot, yes? Well, the census, the census won't allow us to identify individuals. That's the problem. I need to know where they are so I can get hold of them. The census doesn't give me an address or a phone number or anything. They ask questions about income, but if I want to ask questions, I'm not answering interested in the census answers. I want to ask my own questions. I'm doing my own survey. The census is a survey. It has useful information, no doubt about it. But I want to ask questions in my own survey, so I need to be able to identify people and approach them. So I need some kind of contact information. The census isn't useful for that. So I can use telephone numbers, but then I'm missing some portion of the population, perhaps the richest and the poorest in the country. A more effective way would be to do random digit dialing. Get a computer program which can identify all numbers that are residential by the prefix code in the beginning only certain exchanges, as they're called, the first three digits of a number after the area code are residential. The computer program knows which uh, digits identify residential numbers. And it will randomly dial every single number. Okay? Every computer has a random number generator. 
and I can tell my computer, please, I need a sample of 1,500 people. Please take 1,500 numbers at random from this whole lot and dial them. If you can't get hold of these 1,500, then move on to the next batch, the next several hundred, okay? And make up for anything you haven't been able to get in touch with and so on and so forth randomly accessing the database until you get 1,500 chosen at random. Okay? Still, I'm not going to be able to get everyone, but it's, that's a pretty good way of generating a good sampling frame. Uh, the census, of course, is one of the surveys that does an awfully good job of getting hold of everybody until recently, the long form, there are those two four census forms, a short form and a long form, the short form and the long form were both compulsory until 2011. Um, that is, everybody was legally obliged to answer the census. Um, and 20% of the people in the country, 20% of the adults, received the long form, which has all kinds of information about it. There's a short form, which the other 80% got, which was only asking a few questions. Um, in a blow to social science research, the government of the day decided that the long form census would no longer be compulsory in Canada. It's a blow to social science research because of all this interesting data. We don't know now how accurate, how valid it's going to be on the long form census. So it's, it's a big problem for marketers, for social science researchers, for policymakers, and so on. But nonetheless, these surveys historically have managed to get hold of uh, about 99% of the adult population. Anyway, the point is I need some kind of sampling thing. I need a list of everyone that I can, so I can access them. And then I need some mechanism that allows me to draw individuals from that list. And I've already told you about one method, and I can actually use a computer to do it. I can simply ask a random number generator to give me a sample of size n. I have to determine how big a sample I want, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Give me a sample of size n, and it'll randomly select until it gets that n number of respondents. Or if I had a list of individuals from an organization, say I wanted to do a survey within a particular organization, I could simply decide, okay, there's a thousand people who belong to this organization. I want a hundred respondents in my survey. Um, so what I'll do is, I will take every tenth individual on that list, and then I would get a random list. Or I can assign a number to all those thousand people and use my random generate, number generator to randomly generate a list of 100 individuals, number one, number 18, number 462, and so on. And I can select those individuals. So I can do it either way. That would be my random sample, okay? Sampling frame, which has everybody of interest, and then a mechanism for drawing those individuals at random. That would be the randomizing method that I use. A way of ensuring that the sampling frame has a known equal, everybody in the sampling frame has a known equal and non-zero chance of being selected. How many individuals do you need in the sample? Well, uh, that depends on how much inaccuracy you're prepared to tolerate. Because the bigger your sample, the more precise the results. Bigger samples are all else the same, everything else being equal, bigger samples are better. They're going to be more accurate, more precise. And here is an interesting and at the same time puzzling fact. For most sociological purposes, for most purposes of political science and many other social sciences, a random sample of between 1,000 and 1,500 people will give acceptably accurate results even if the population that we're interested in is as large as Canada or the United States or China. Think about it. A sample of only 1,000 to 1,500 will usually give acceptably accurate results, even if we're dealing with a huge population. 
of tens or hundreds of millions. How can that be? Uh, well, let me say it more precisely, first of all. If you draw 20 random samples of 1,500 individuals each, so I draw 20 samples of 1,500 individuals each, randomly, 19 of those 20 samples are going to be accurate within two and a half percentage points. What does that mean exactly? If I draw nine, 20 samples, 19 of them are going to be accurate within two and a half percentage points. Well, let's say that I do a survey. I randomly select 1,500 Canadians. I want to know what their opinion is of the Prime Minister. Do you think Prime Minister Harper is doing a good job? And they have to answer yes or no on this survey. And I find out that 50% say, yes, he's doing a good job. The way I should read that result is that in the population, between 47.5% and 52.5% of people believe that the Prime Minister is doing a good job. And I will get that result 95% of the time. That is, 19 out of every 20 times I draw a sample like this, a random sample of 1,500 people, I know that I'm going to get the same result, or get approximately the same result in that margin of error. Uh, I'm not going to explain how I know that. When you study statistics, you'll find out how that is known. But that is what is known. Um, so we conclude, in other words, something about the population as a whole from the sample. But what we conclude is not that the sample finding is the reality out there in the population, rather that the sample finding is within two and a half percentage points of what we would find in the population 19 times out of 20. If we wanted greater certainty, if we wanted to be certain that uh, we would have the same results uh, uh, 99 times out of 100. If we wanted to lower the margin of error, then we would need a larger sample. Now, let's look at this picture. Here's the first instance, the top line. Let's say here we're asking for people's opinions about which way they're going to vote in the coming election. And they have two choices. I'm just keeping things simple. They can vote conservative or liberal. And let's say we discover that 48% of the people in our randomly chosen sample say they would vote conservatives for the conservatives, and 50% say they would vote liberal. What can I say about the population as a whole? What should I say? What should I report in my newspaper article on the results of this poll? Anybody? Should I say that the Conservatives are going to lose the election if the election were held today? The Liberals are likely to win. Liberals are ahead by two points. Anyone? No, because? Yes, we should say no. We don't know that the Conservatives are actually ahead of the Liberals, or sorry, behind the Liberals in the population. Because we're dealing here with margins of error. That first figure we find, 48%, is accurate within two and a half percentage points. So what's 48% minus uh, two and a half percent? And what's 48? And what's 48% plus two and a half percent? It's within that margin of error. 50 point, sorry, 50.5% to 45.5%, that error, that margin, that we know that figure is accurate 19 times out of 20. And for the liberals, we know that that figure is accurate plus or minus 2.5%, meaning between 47.5% and 52.5% of the population support the liberals. But what's problematic about this is if you look at those 2.5% margin of errors, you see that they overlap, right? In the, in, the, in the curly brackets, that's the margin of error. You see they actually overlap. If the margins of error overlap, 
then we must say that the differences we discover in the sample are not statistically significant. That is to say, we can't be sure that these are actual differences in the population. Here's the next case. We do another survey the following week, and we come up with these results. 48% conservative, 55% liberal. What does this say? Well, this says that those margins of error do not overlap. They are separated from one another. There's, there's daylight between them. And if those margins of error do not overlap, that means that the difference between the conservative and the liberal results are statistically significant, and the liberals are in the population ahead of the conservatives. And if an election were held today, then the probability is that the liberals would take the election. Okay? So that's all that a survey can say is that the results are accurate within a certain margin of error, and we would get similar results, say, 95% of the time. Usually, uh, we're prepared in the social sciences to accept a 0 0.05 margin of error, a 5% margin of error. Okay? So that, that, that is to say, one out of every 10 or 20 samples will find this. In medical research, people are not prepared to tolerate that much error, which is why if you look at medical research, it's usually based on far larger samples. We don't want to have medical research which tells us that if you have this drug that has a good effect on people with a particular disease, and if you take somewhere between a thimbleful and a bucketful, then it will have good results. We would like to know something more precise than that, right? And if we want that precision, then we need larger samples that have smaller margins of error and are more likely to be more right most of the time, okay? But in social science, where we'll tolerate more error, it's not the end of the world for out by a little bit, then we're prepared to have a wider margin of error. Okay, now, this... Uh, this leads me to conclude that probability sampling, which I've described, enables us to conduct surveys that permit us to generalize from a part, namely the sample, to the population, the whole group that we're interested in, within known margins of error. Now, I want to talk a bit about the validity of survey data. Remember, validity is all about whether or not what we're measuring actually measures what we think we're measuring. Uh, I preface my remarks by noting that there are three different kinds, three main ways to conduct a survey. The first one is a mail questionnaire, which is a form that you receive in the mail uh, if you're a respondent, if you're selected randomly as a respondent. And you return that questionnaire in a self-addressed stamped envelope through the mail system to the researcher. Uh, now, the main advantage of conducting mail questions is it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it costs the, the paper and the envelope and the stamp and the return stamp in that envelope. It's not much. Um, but it has serious drawbacks, which is why you don't get too many mail questions. Uh, for one thing, it often results in an unacceptably low response rate, a mail questionnaire does. A response rate is the number of people who answer the questionnaire divided by the number of people who are asked to answer the questionnaire expressed as a percent. So the response rate is relatively low. You might find if you do a mail questionnaire that only 15% of the people you ask answer the question. Well, if only 15% are asked answering the question, you might want to send out more questionnaires, but you get worried that these people have some specific high motivation for answering, and that there are unlikely people who don't answer, and therefore your sample is going to be biased in serious ways. So you're always worried if you get a very low response rate. Um, 
Another problem with male questionnaires is that the interviewer is not present to explain problematic questions and response options. So for example, I may ask a question, which is perfectly clear to me, and I may give certain response options again, which is clear to me, but the respondent may not understand my question because I haven't stated it clearly enough. If I am an interviewer and interviewing the person face to face, then the person can ask questions. What do you mean by X? What do you mean by Y? But if the person just got this thing in the mail and has to imagine themselves what it means, they might misconstrue the meaning of some of the questions. But that's a problem. So we prefer face-to-face -face surveys, face-to-face -face interview surveys, in which questions are presented to a respondent by the interview during the meeting. Um, now, in this case, we usually have to, as you can imagine, what it means to interview 1,500 men and select people, let's say in the city of Toronto or across the country. If I'm going to do this face to face, I need a small army of interviews. I can't do it myself. Typically, what happens when you select a household of men for a survey, then somebody, usually they'll get a letter in advance saying, you know, on October 25th, at 3 p.m. or 5 p.m., somebody will come to your home and do this and this and this and ask you questions about that and that. Then, then you have to actually go to the person's house. Guess what? Half the time, they're not there. So then you have to go back a second time and a third time. The best, the best time. And then you might give up after three times okay, and draw somebody else at random from the population to replace that person. Now just think what that means. Yeah, You're paying one, an interviewer $25 an hour to go across town to a particular one, individual's home and interview that person. The interview itself might take an hour. Transportation there and back is another hour. Okay, the person might have to do it, might have to go over three times or four times before succeeding. Or may not succeed and may have to choose somebody else to interview. Then that. Each questionnaire that is answered in a serious survey costs $100 to $150. Multiply that by 1500 and you see the survey to be an expensive bit of business. If you're paying $100 per survey times $1,500, right? So that's one of the big drawbacks of this kind of survey that costs a lot of money. But the beauty of it is that Interviews there to explain things, and they're typically acceptably high response rates. By the way, I also have to mention the training interviewers cost. They're also paying 25 bucks or so an hour just to train the person how to do an interview properly. So it can be very expensive. Uh, it's because of the expense that telephone interviews have become so popular in recent decades. We determined that telephone interviews can actually provide results that are about as good as face-to-face -face interviews. Hence, the growing popularity of this event. Of course, the person doing the interviewing can answer questions in such a setting as well. Um, I also need to tell you, before I talk about the uh, validity question, that there are a couple of types of questionnaires, or questions that can be asked, Two main types are closed-ended and open-ended. With closed-ended questions, we give a set number of responses. Okay, we might ask for the person's annual income, and then say, is it between zero and ten thousand dollars a year, between ten and twenty-five thousand, between twenty-five and fifty, and so on and so forth. There may be five different responses. We can ask closed-ended questions when we know what the responses are, or what they are very likely to be. On the other hand, we often don't know what the answers are to certain questions. Uh, I may ask, I may want to know something about your identity, your ethnic identity. And I want, you know, I want to hear about where you're from, and how you feel, and how your ethnic identity changes in different contexts, when you're at home, when you're praying, when you're at school, and so on. And to know those things, I might need something like an open-ended question, or a set of open-ended questions, which asks you those things, and just asks you to talk 
in reply, in your own words, and I record your response either by taking notes or by actually